Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, sponsored by the California Fire Science Consortium and part of the UC Davis Forest and Fire Ecology Random Lectures, or FERAL series. My name is Allie Paulson, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'm the coordinator for the Sierra Nevada region of the California Fire Science Consortium. We're a fire science outreach organization. Our mission includes increasing communication between fire researchers, managers, policymakers, tribes, landowners, homeowners, and other stakeholders. The California Fire Science Consortium is part of the nationwide Fire Science Exchange Network, funded through the Joint Fire Science Program. Uh, the webinar today is being recorded and will be posted within the next two weeks on our website and YouTube channel, along with closed captioning. If you're having any technical issues, feel free to send me a chat and I can help you once the webinar gets going. We'll also be using the chat function to collect any questions for our speaker. So as the pre presentation moves along, feel free to type any of your questions into the chat box. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Beverly Boulogne. She'll be telling us about the complex interactions of native insects and diseases of true furs in the Southern Sierras. Beverly is a forest entomologist with the USDA Forest Service Region 5, State and Private Forestry, Forest Health Protection, stationed in the Stanislaus National Forest. She serves the El Dorado, Inyo, Stanislaus, Sierra, and Sequoia National Forests, as well as Yosemite, Devil's Post Pile, Sequoia Kings Canyon, and Death Valley National Parks, and all federal lands in between. Forest Health Protection works closely with multiple agencies, universities, collaborators, and partners in topics related to forest health. They also provide technical assistance and training in forest entomology and pathology, as well as developing additional resource products and technology for the region. We're really excited to have Beverly here today. She was originally scheduled to give a feral lecture last spring, just before COVID hit, and so we're glad that we were able to reschedule for today. So without further ado, I'll pass the presentation over to Beverly Blown. Thank you, Allison. Um, can you guys hear me now? Yep, sounds good. All right, well, thank you. So, um, come on, we're, okay, I'm trying to switch screens. Okay, so, um, so what I'd like to talk about today is, you know, fire related in some regard, um, but just talking about the native insects and diseases that are part of the, you know, that part of the complex that, you know, contributes to mortality or decline um, and those changes in disturbances of true fur forest in the Southern Sierra Nevada. So my objective today too was to Kind of help people see the forest or see the tree from the forest. I mean, we talk very quickly about disturbances, you know, fire, insects, and disease, but I just wanted to help folks understand maybe that insect and disease part just a little bit better. And again, particularly on true furs. So I will be speaking about some of the native damage agents like dwarf mistletoes, pathogens, particularly root diseases, defoliator, and bark beetles. I'm gonna talk about where and maybe how these agents interact with our hosts and with each other, as well as observations of my past 20 years here on the forest, or actually in the South Sierras. So true furs, I wanted to focus, you know, primarily in the Southern Nevada, because as I said, this is where I've really been stationed for most of my time with the Forest Service. But the white fur, um, the white fur and the red fur that will be, oh man, that sorry about that. The picture for red fur range isn't showing up, but the white fur um, range that we'll be talking about here and the subspecies that we have mostly here in California is um, this, it's uh, Aves con color, but it's the subspecies is Ioia ana and other true furs that do occur in California, such as grand fur, I won't be um, mentioning in this talk, but a lot of these same insects also affect uh, grand fur. So 
sorry, about that picture of what white fur and red fur look like. And they are very, very similar in appearance. So until you know kind of what elevation in your at, or you, even if you have two trees to compare them to, they're actually very similar in characteristics, but there are, you know, distinguishing features about um, each of them. But again, focusing on the insects and pathogens. Um, in 2016, Das et al. found that, you know, that insects and pathogens were really significant contributors to a lot of the mortality that happens, particularly even in good years. So he has long-term monitoring plots down in Sequoia Kings Canyon, in which he's really been able to look at times of when we did have good temperatures and good precipitation, as well as drought events um, and other kind of, you know, other disturbances that also happen on the landscape. But that biotic agents still account for about 58% of the mortality out there. And insects in particular account for half of that. Bark beetles um, made up even a large percentage of that percentage. And that pathogens contributed nearly a quarter to that mortality. And he found that the agents, you know, it's not just kind of it's one bark beetle or one root disease, but that they actually work very, um, very intricately and that they work in this accumulating stress spiral, spiral, but also given the right conditions, they can also work independently or if conditions are right for their population growth, they will make the most of every opportunity to expand and to grow. And he said that there's more to that growth and mortality paradigm that if you know that, you know, the weak trees are always the first ones to go out and that's not necessarily true, particularly with our bark beetles, which are highly prone to, um, to outbreaks. And we do have a sense of what maybe kind of, you know, of healthy levels when we say forest health, exactly what kind of levels of maybe insect and diseases are we actually trying to reach? Are we actually trying to, you know, create that resiliency um, that we want to build? And Maloney and Rizzo did compare uh, a pristine forest type that was very similar in conditions to a lot of the forest in the Sierra Nevada. The Sierra San Pedro Martir is a pristine forest in Northern Baja, California, Mexico, and has a lot of the same species um, as well as temperate conditions that we have here. And they found that native pathogens and bark beetles, again, account for even a larger percentage of that mortality. Um, oh, and something to say about the, the martyr forest is that the reason it's considered a pristine forest is that native, uh, natural fires have been allowed to run um, and burn burn through this area and logging or any type of management has actually been very limited here. So if we want to consider something almost to its complete natural state, this is the area to do it. And so again, a large, uh, you know, three fourths of the mortality that, um, that happens in this area is actually caused by uh, pathogens of bark beetles. 88% of that mortality was in white fur attributed to fur engraver. They did actually find that even in these, what we would think is a much drier forest, was that there was still root disease present and that the diversity of pines mixed in with firs down in this area actually interfered um, and created buffers to prevent a lot of the root uh, or disease spread not necessarily just root disease, but it didn't affect the intensity. And what they, what they hypothesize about, you know, comparing these to the more Northern forest is that insect and diseases may not be acting in the same manner in our forests here in California, just simply because of the, the complete change in conditions that we have here compared to those further South. So again, I just wanted to help folks take that little deeper dive into the life of a 
trufer? What is it like to be a trufer? And what are you experiencing? And we know that furs have benefited in the last century, you know, because of fire suppression. They are a shade intolerant tree. So they do really well. Uh, the regeneration does really well, you know, in our kind of more dense um, closed canopy forest. And we've received pretty good pre precipitation um, at the beginning of the last century and with mild temperatures as well. But what I've noticed in my, you know, in my travels around the Southern Sierras is that there is a lot of constant stress and chronic stress that's occurring. And while they may not be big disturbances that are easily seen, they are they are small things that are happening that are again kind of ratcheting up that stress levels for a lot of these trees. And that, you know, that constant stress, stress that comes from, you know, insects and diseases, a lot of which we can't see, as well as other biotic and abiotic stressors and definitely wildfires. So um, I wanted to show this picture because I rarely see a white fur this good. Um, most of the white furs or red furs that I've seen usually have pretty raggedy crowns or not much crown at all. So of course, you know, this is, um, this is the worst of that I've seen, but they usually, you know, too also don't get this bad. So what is backwards. Sorry about that. I was trying to hide this bar, um, but I'll go on. So in 1937, as well as in 1957, uh, Struble et al. Um, tried to just record what he found were the most common uh, damage agents, insects, and diseases that he was finding on furs. And what he found were these guys that I've mentioned here. And I've, I've mentioned a few of them quite doubly and because I wanted to show where their locations can be found on the tree. So even dwarf mistletoes right here can attack on branches as well as the main bowl. Um, there are some that are confined right to you know the smaller diameter limbs and branches and there is two that only affect uh, white fur. But then there are our um, wood borers down here, kind of in the lower eight feet of the bowl that we usually find, as well as some root diseases that we can't see unless we do some excavation. And I'll go into all of these in a little bit more detail. So the most common one that's really attributed with direct mortality to furs is fur engraver, Scolitis ventralis. And so it also attacks grand fur, uh, Douglas fir is not a true fir, so it actually has its own bark beetle. But the fir engraver really is associated with other damage agents. Um, and the reason for this is that it's one of the rare bark beetles that doesn't have an aggregating pheromone. It has a primary attraction to terpenes that are released by trees that are weakened and stressed. And so it's able to find those weak trees amongst all of the other ones. But other damage agents are also honing in to those same cues. And so multiple things um, are also attacking true fur at the same time. Or there can be some other kind of prior injury or infection, again, primarily from pathogens, that may not be visible or not easily um, easy to find, you know, unless you're looking really hard or you have binoculars or again, trees are showing symptoms that are typically associated with those agents. And so when we when we see kind of big losses attributed to fur engraver, it usually follows big drought events that we have in California. And we do find that true fur, the ones that are most vulnerable are those in areas where there's less than 25% precipitation. If you want to confirm that if a tree was actually attacked by fur engraver, you can take your hatchet and remove the bark 
just to expose the cambium and phloem layer. And it's one of the rare beetles too that create this horizontal gallery instead of kind of the vertical galleries that you know of with most, uh, most of the dendroctinus. And so again, it makes this horizontal gallery and it lays its eggs in niches along the side. And so if you can imagine several bark beetles feeding on this tree, that this creates eventually quite a large, um, you know, it, it amounts to a large girdling effect on the tree. And because fern engraver is also attacking trees that actually are fairly, fairly weak, um, you may not see pitch tubes. Um, and if those of you that don't know what pitch tubes are, they're usually about, you know, the size of little popcorn that are attached to the tree that pines that you usually find associated with pines um, and their bark beetles. And it's the way for the for pines to kind of kind of flush out attacking beetles. But firs don't have that same kind of defense mechanism. They do have resin, but it's not in the same kind of structure or um, you know, or or kind of you know arranged in the same regard as as pines are. So they're more um, kind of subcortical. And so if a, if firs are trying to attack these trees, what you might see is what you might see in a tree that may be fairly healthy and actually being able to repel fur engraver is you'll actually see a lot of these pitch streamers. But mostly a tree that is undergoing a fur engraver attack, what you would only find maybe is just some boring dust in the crevices. And again, fur engraver is just trying to hone in on those very, you know, kind of microscopic cues that that's telling it that this tree is weak. But it's also if a branch breaks off or, you know, or if the tree is just injured from, you know, from some other mechanical injury, fern graver still may just kind of localize or concentrate in, in that spot. And so what Struvel found was even a tree that had lived, you know, for maybe about um, this picture right here on the right that lived for 200 trees, it was attacked multiple different places. And while the beetle itself may have been successful, the, the call for other beetles to kind of mass attack that tree just wasn't there. So what happens is usually that you'll see these kind of areas where you'll see the, you'll see the gallery, but you'll see that the tree was trying to heal itself over. And this is very common. What you might notice um, with this number of attack or in a certain year where you have multiple attacks, that's usually also kind of telling you that there might have been a drought um, happening at that time. And so the population of fern graver had just um, you know, increased. And so this tree may have been feeling a lot of pressure from fern graver attacks, whether or not it was actually susceptible and weak. So again, here's just a nice color slide of, you know, decades back on this tree that you can see the old gallery. And there are two other bark beetles that are under the same genus, Scolitis praeseps and subscaber. And praeseps does make the same type of looking gallery, but you know, it's a little bit shorter. It's, <laughs> I know this is kind of strange to say, a little bit more straighter than uh, fur engraver galleries. But the way that these two find their, you know, their successful niches is that they usually stay under parts of the tree that are four inches or smaller in diameter. So Praetheps usually attacks just smaller diameter trees in general or confines itself usually to the terminal or you know, kind of upper crown area. Versus subscaver, it usually can find branches um, that are just weak, just singular branches on trees that are weak and just simply attack those areas on the tree. The wood borers and ambrosia beetles, I'm not gonna go too much into these because most of these, a lot of the natives that we know, there are a few 
that do become kind of that primary damage agent. For most wood borers, most of them are not. Most of them really do wait until um, a lot of the bark beetles have already successfully killed trees and the tree is already certain of death. And then they'll kind of come in as a cleaning crew and just kind of, you know, further help decompose that tree. But the reason I bring these guys up in particular is that I've noticed that some of them are starting to attack what, you know, what we would consider healthy trees because I'm finding them under the bark on trees that still have a fairly decent, you know, green crown. And so we don't usually call trees completely dead until, you know, the needles turn red. And so we're finding, you know, a lot of this activity in the lower, in the lower part of the tree, as you would expect, in association with fir and graver. And as for ambrosia beetles, they're quite the same way. They like uh, their trees um, to be much more deteriorated. Uh, and usually we don't find them until almost a year after death on a lot of conifers. But we are finding, or at least I did a couple of years ago, start finding activity of ambrosia beetles on green, you know, green colored um, crown trees. And ambrosia beetles, again, you know, they're, the way you tell that it's under ambrosial beetle attack is, you may not see this much boring dust. I've never seen this much boring dust under a fir, but I use this photo as just kind of the difference of what you would see in terms of boring dust um, in comparison to maybe the brown coloring that you would notice more for the other bark beetles. I do need to talk about Douglas fir tussock moth because this is kind of a reoccurring problem that we have with our white fir. It doesn't attack red fir, but Douglas fir tussock moth, hence the name, attacks primarily Douglas fir as well as white fir uh, here in the Sierras. And it's an insect that, um, that doesn't work on, you know, kind of temperature events. It really works on kind of this cyclic nature that every seven to 10 years, we just have this surge in tussock moth. And most people maybe have seen it when they've been out camping is that it's usually, you know, one that you would pick up because it's so pretty. <laughs> it's this nice little fuzzy, um, fuzzy caterpillar, but it can be quite damaging when populations are fairly high. And these were trees that I had just um, found last year in Sequoia's, Sequoia Kings Canyon um, that were sustaining maybe about 30% defoliation. Now, while this might look pretty bad, um, the studies have found though that trees can withstand you know, up to even 90% defoliation before they can be considered directly killed by tussock moth. But unfortunately, you know, what you see with this is that these trees are just, you know, they're weak because they're losing their photosynthetic ability, which then makes them susceptible to other damage agents or other insects to then, you know, eventually just kill them. Pathogens and parasites. So, you know, I'm not a pathologist, <laughs> but I have worked with the same pathologist here in Sonora for quite a long time. And I've learned, you know, just enough to be dangerous. So I wanted to um, give you as much information as I know, and also just talk about them because I think they're kind of one of the more important, even more important sometimes than the bark beetles um, in terms of kind of, you know, that insidious, insidious damage agent that you don't really see there until you're actually looking for it. And then you know what it's doing. So the dwarf mistletoes um, followed along with cytospora uh, cankers and then the root diseases. So a little bit about dwarf mistletoes. Dwarf mistletoes are kind of a leafly, tr leafy, a leafless, I'm sorry, leafless true plant that are obligate parasites on their hosts. They're actually true seed plants that um, do produce their own seeds 
which are then spread either by birds feeding on those seeds or they can shoot out quite a distance to affect um, any neighboring host. And the Arcithobium species in general, the dwarf mistletoes, are very specific to their hosts. So there is a species that attacks just white fur and a species that attacks just red fur. And, you know, the same with the other conifers. Um, so, you know, even if white fur and red fur were right next to each other, you know, seeds from that plant um, will not infect, you know, a different, a different host type. And for kind of a more realistic view of what they look like, they can be fairly well hidden because of their green color. They are a slightly more yellow color, but you know, again, unless you're looking for them, they're very easy to overlook. And these infections, because they are infection points, they're weakened points on the tree, that 20% of these dwarf mistletoe um, infection sites are actually also infected with another fungal canker known as Cytospora. And Cytospora, while you know, the mistletoe may not actually kill the limb, Cytospora does kind of come in and cause you know, dead spots. So it uses these kind of anchor points or these wounds that are created by the mistletoe as kind of entry points to be able to infect the tree. And so when you're looking at trees like this and you're wondering, well, what's going on? Hopefully, you know, I've kind of given you that, um, that idea that, you know, maybe you might need to look a little harder. And so I, so I was walking around this forest and I noticed this tree that was bent over and noticed all the swellings on the branches. So again, dwarf mistletoe infection can actually be pretty severe. And it's, you know, again, unless you're actually looking at every single branch, you may not see it. And I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I think that's, you know, only a partial part of the, the bowl that I found there. So there may be even more, you know, that are not shown in this photo. So you can see they, they can, they can, you know, be at very high severity, even in singular individual trees. And there's that photo again. So on small trees that are underneath larger trees that have high infection levels, you know, these then just become, you know, the, the sink that catches all of the seeds that, you know, that fly through the air. And then unfortunately they land on these smaller trees in the, you know, in the understory. So, um, so, you know, photos that, you know, unless you know what you're looking for, or if you have a good pair of binoculars and you see trees like this, you know, now you maybe have a better understanding of what might be happening. I did need to mention the true mistletoe. In California, we seem to have a kind of, you know, a, a preponderance of these true mistletoes. This is in the same species of, or the same genus of, of mistletoes that actually infect oaks, the phoridendron. And these are also parasitic seed plants that only occur on white fur. So red fur does not have these, these true leafy mistletoes. But again, just like dwarf mistletoes, you know, they can in, intensify in individual trees and multiple infections can, you know, again, just add to that stress and even cause uh, some breakage. Moving on to diseases of first, there are three main um, kind of pathogens that I see most common in the true furs. And Heterobacidium occidentale, some of you might know it as Fomizinosis or Anosum for short. That used to be the um, kind of the common name, um, and it used to actually be the species name for Heterobacidium, but now they've recently changed it to Heterobacidium occidentale for particularly referring to the type which infects true furs. And then there's our malaria, which some of you might know is actually a very, very large group. 
and has a species that infects most of the oaks here in California. And then there's Echinodontium ticorum. Um, this one is affectionately known as ET for short, and this one is more of a heartwood and sapwood decayer. But I'd like to focus on heterobasidium because really this is what I see 90% of the time in the forest. And because this one is a root disease, you know, unless you're actually looking for it, you're really rarely ever just going to be, you know, stumbling around in the forest and actually find it. The best way to find it is to find an old cut stump that has its top layer um, deteriorating and even, you know, a little kind of holy in nature. And if you look down into that uh, deep dark hole, what you'll notice is that you might see some woody structures here with this white lining. And if you reach your hand down in and avoid all the mosquitoes and don't get bit, you'll pull out this really kind of hard honk that has a nice white porous layer in which spores are released. But you can see this is kind of the symptoms that we see associated with uh, heterobasidium. This is called a, it's called a laminated decay. And so what's happening here is that the cell walls are separating from themselves. And so this does affect the structural integrity as well as, you know, the conducting opacity of this tree. So I've been able to identify that when I come into clearings, if it is potentially a root disease area, um, what you might notice is that host species, like in this photo, most of the firs are dying, um, although the non-host species like incense cedar are actually doing well, as well as some of the shrubs. And what you might also notice too, because of that laminated root decay, is that you notice trees that would be broken off or even uprooted from the base. And this is a native pathogen, and it does, you know, it, it does, you know, disperse by wind, windborne um, uh, spores, and it, you know, it 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 um, establishes best on fresh cut stumps that may or may not have the infection, but you know, that are fairly, you know, still. Um, uh, still very fresh, you know, and with water. And so these spores can establish quickly and easily on these fresh cut stumps because also too, there's a large surface area for them to infect. So they can also land on wounds at the base. They will, you know, if they land on, if they land on branches, they probably won't get established. But another, but another way that this pathogen travels is also by root to root contact. So if spores establish on the stump and the stump, you know, again, uh, with white fur, there is a lot of root to root contact underground. So living trees that might even be quite a distance away, if underground their roots are connected, that pathogen can travel from one tree to another. And so it starts making, you know, it starts traveling throughout the stand. And you might not notice it in a green tree, but you might notice that the crown is starting to thin or what may happen eventually is that it would be attacked by bark beetles. So just kind of a horizontal view um, of looking at, you know, how this, this pathogen moves through the stand is that here would be an infected uh, snag or a stump. And that again, that root to root contact, if these are all host species for this pathogen, it'll slowly move throughout the stand. So that says then and now. And so Studies have, you know, been conducted to really try to look at how much root disease really is out there. And back in 1989, uh, Slaughter and Parmeter uh, really did try to do random plots throughout California to really assess, you know, how much heterobasidian, uh, not necessarily just in true first stance, but just how much heterobasidian was out there. 
And this is the same way, I'm sorry, that you would um, also detect heterobasidian, the species of heterobasidian and irregular in pines is by looking through some stumps. And slaughter and par meter found about an 18% incidence of heterobasidium in true fur stands in national forests, but they really believe that that infection level is actually much higher just because, again, the difficulty of confirming infections. So while you might see, you know, these kinds of stumps and you might see the lamination, until you actually find the, uh, the conch or real good signs of the pathogen, you don't really want to just confirm that, yes, that's what, you know, that's what's causing all this mortality. Several new studies have stated that, you know, while pests incidents, pathogens and, um, and diseases, I'm sorry, insects and diseases, <laughs> and the mortality that happened in red fur ecosystems are actually within that natural range of variation that we, you know, recently talk about, that they're still actually in historical ranges, but that if we increase other things like climate, like temperature, that there's the high potential for a lot of this mortality to actually increase. And we don't, you know, again, because it's so hard to confirm heterobasidian in stands that, you know, direct mortality from that if it was just simply pathogen killing trees, that level of mortality is still unknown, as well as the rate that pathogens still spread in the stand. We, there's not really a good idea yet of how quickly or how slowly that is. And most of the time what happens is that insects or other kinds of damage agents really kind of pick up on those root, root um, infected trees, root disease infected trees and kill off the tree before we would even know if root disease was even in that tree. So they're often considered killed by wind throw or insects. And we, again, just, you know, as I've been saying that we believe that, you know, heterobasidian really is a lot more widespread, particularly in mixed conifer forests or true fir stands in, um, in the Southern Sierras. So I just wanted to show this picture again that I know I went through these really quickly, but also that this is not an exhaustive list of, you know, that these are the only things that occur on true furs because there are a lot of other secondaries as well. But that again, you know, if you're seeing trees in these kind of, you know, conditions that crowns don't look very well, they're a little thin, or that if you see large patches of tree mortality as well as snap trees, maybe now you'll have this kind of better idea of what it is you're possibly looking at. So I thought that, you know, if there's too many trees, then it's not surprising that we would see so much, you know, so much activity from insect and diseases. And studies have shown that, you know, again, firs are prolific uh, regenerators because of their ability to, you know, grow in these dark uh, conditions. So, so a lot of them are able to make it to maturity compared to, you know, a lot of the pines that need more of that full sunlight or much more open canopy than the firs do. And so because of good weather and past management that, Firs have even moved into areas that were previously dominated by pines, especially down in the lower elevations. However, with climate change, there's been a lot of studies about just bark beetles and other damage agents actually doing well, um, just you know, in terms of their phenology and behavior because of longer growing seasons or mild. Um, mild winters that a lot of them had been able to be a lot more successful. And, you know, on the flip side, you know, with warmer and drier uh, conditions that does make trees more stressed and weak. So true for really may not be able to sustain the density 
um, or its current range into the future if we're expecting climate change. Now talking about the California drought and the drought you know, was considered to happen in 2012 up to about 2016 and several studies were done to look at that. Um, Fedig et al. Um, did, some, did some stands or did some plots at, at varying elevations from the El Dorado down to the Sequoia. And he found that white fir was kind of the third highest tree loss during the drought. Um, and he found that most of those um, tree losses happened actually in the mid-sized range and that some areas really you know, sustained heavy mortality, but some areas didn't. And those, of, those might've been areas that still had good moisture um, in them. So Stevenson did uh, long-term study plots in Sequoia Kings Canyon, and he had found that most of just the overall mortality of conifers due to the drought was attributed to bark beetles. So 96% of that mortality was bark beetles related. And that in terms of white fur, all sizes, all different size classes of white furs were actually killed. And he did see increases in subscaber, that kind of secondary beetle that I mentioned earlier, found uh, dying in the small diameter trees. So it was subscaber that may have actually killed off a lot of that smaller diameter that fur engraver wouldn't have it. And lions further, um, also in Sequoia Kings Canyon, did, did mention that she did notice there were actually high levels of precepts and subscaber and that possibly you know for a lot of these secondaries if again conditions are just right they may have actually reached outbreak levels and really contributed to a lot of the mortality or even damage that we saw out there so the um, and what Lyons thinks is that you know mortality had decreased um, there, were, there was less trees being killed as you went up in elevation and as, you know, you, if you were of a certain diameter. But the reason I wanted to show you this was because so, you know, again, the drought, the drought event, what most folks consider happened in 2012 to 2016, and you can see from this map, there was this kind of progression of mortality that happened. And most of it was down actually in the lower elevation in the pine. And the pine was very heavily hit. Um, and so, you know, we still are seeing accruing mortality even after the drought was considered officially over. But you can see that it did start moving to the higher elevations. And uh, this is the Palmer Drought Severity Index of just the, the San Joaquin watershed. And we, you know, while we, well, while the drought event happened in, you know, again, just this area, you can see that at least for the past 30 years, we've actually sustained several years of drought and actually pretty severe drought. And that 2018 and 2020, are nearly almost as bad as when we had that last drought event. And, you know, the mean annual temperature in California has been increasing. So we know that climate change really is happening. Again, from the, from the previous slide, we did have periods of drought in the 30s and in the 60s and in the 70s, but we also, just had mild temperatures then. And so trees were able to recover because they had much cooler temperatures. They weren't having to deal with the stress of, you know, really high heat. And so again, for the last 30 years, not only did we have drought, we had much more increase than the average in um, uh, mean annual temperature. So I wanted to show you some maps of aerial surveys uh, throughout the years. Uh, since we really started um, kind of ramping up our aerial survey, and this is just simply showing 
acres that were affected with that we attributed to only fur engraver. So these are acres infected. Um, and from 1993 to 1996 is just kind of you know a grouping. But I wanted to say that we really didn't start covering the entire um, state not until about 1996. So you know it could be that there are you know places that we missed in those years when we didn't cover the you know Yosemite or the Sierra National Forest because there was activity that we did pick up on the Inyo between this uh, between this time frame. But by you know again 1996 we did start flying the whole state. So for the next decade from 2000 to 2009. Uh, we did start seeing increases again in fur and graver um, uh, affected areas down in the Sierras, a uh, really big one, the Calaveras area, uh, Calaveras Ranger District in Upper Stanislaus National Forest. And then by 2010 to 2015, kind of that, that beginning of those drought, uh, the drought event, you know, a lot of this mortality has really started picking up. And that was just five years from 2010 to 2015. By 2016 to 2019, it's really exploded. And so this graph is just another way of looking at the previous map that you can see that, that acres affected by fur engraver just really exploded. And it peaked in 2017 um, and dropped down maybe by 2018 because we did have that good water event. But really in comparison to the last 20 years that these numbers are still incredibly high. And that this, I'm sorry, I can't hide that black screen, but this is um, uh, a drought kind of the drought map from March and February of this year. And you could see that temperatures are highly departed from, from what we would consider normal here throughout the entire state. So we are expecting kind of a lot of, of just bark beetle mortality in general to really happen this summer. And so unless trees are, you know, in really good sites where they don't have too much competition, uh, they may, you know, not have that much mistletoe infection. They may be able to withstand, um, you know, these drought cycles that we regularly have in California. But if they're in stands where, you know, they do have a lot of competition, they've already suffered um, a lot of branch loss, maybe from mistletoe or other uh, or other bark beetles, you know, and they don't have much crown left, they are be then the whole tree. Um, this becomes much more susceptible to fur engraver. And we do have episodes where fur engraver doesn't need that, doesn't need that root disease, you know, to eventually, you know, overcome and overwhelm, you know, trees that are under even mild forms of stress. So what I've observed in conclusion, <laughs> white fur and red fur mortality, as I've shown, is is currently above the average level um, in the Southern Sierras. And even if mortality was low, you know, again, I've hoped, hoped to convince you that there are parts of the Sierra where, you know, these spurs are really under chronic stress, uh, stress. And that insect and diseases, you know, kind of maybe working in that corrective, um, corrective, you know, disturbance that's trying to just kind of balance out, um, um, you know, these natural disturbances that, you know, aren't happening with our, you know, management that we're still just kind of controlling fires. And so we're finding that firs are much more vulnerable to disturbance, particularly the larger diameter trees. And red fir, red fir ecosystems are especially vulnerable. We, we do think that root disease is more prevalent than what past surveys show, and particularly in stands that, that have been cut. Because there were, there is currently treatments right now that work as preventative measures, but there was a time when, you know, we didn't know that we would be spreading 
or kind of, you know, really exas exacerbating, you know, the, the establishment of root disease by having these cut stumps without treatments. And that healthy and vigorous trees, you know, in forests are really not absent. These are native uh, insects and diseases. So, you know, we know that they do occur in forest, um, in healthy forest, but that, you know, their levels are much lower or they can have outbreaks, but it's usually, um, it's usually kind of controlled or it declines because of other conditions of the stand that don't need kind of that intervention to do that, you know, to, to do mitigation or to, you know, suppress populations. So I'm really sorry to overwhelm you with all that, that, you know, when you go out into the forest, that to think that you have to look at every tree and every canopy, and I know that can feel very overwhelming, but hopefully what I've instilled you with is just this kind of more, you know, insight to that when you see trees in the forest and you actually see some kind of insect or disease, that then you take a harder look and that you look at possibly, well, how, how much of this do I see out there? And what is its severity in certain trees or even within the stand? And that I really hope that, you know, um, land managers really do, you know, start incorporating insect and disease in their planning and their treatment strategies, just because, you know, while we, we know it's something that works in the background, and we do know that it works to forest benefit, that sometimes, you know, we know that, that levels might be higher than what we know them to be historically. And if you don't know what you're looking at, uh, feel free to call me or my colleague, uh, Martin McKenzie, who's also in this office. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. With that, I will stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you, Beverly. That was a great presentation. I know that I learned a lot that I didn't know before. I've been noting the questions, and if anybody else has any additional questions, please go ahead and post them into the chat box. Uh, also, I posted a link to a evaluation survey. It just takes a couple minutes to fill out, and that really helps us at the California Fire Science Consortium uh, help us know how we're doing. So if you have a minute, please go ahead and fill that out. Our first question today is from Lyle Bickley. He says, as a landowner with fir trees, is there any way to treat or otherwise help make trees less vulnerable to disease, insects, or mistletoe? Um, I noticed Dr. Dave Rizzo is also on the call, so, <laughs> and he knows a lot about pathogens as well. Um, but, you know, that unless it's just kind of one tree that you can really you know, provide that individualized treatment, um, you know, for forest or if you have large properties, really, you know, the best thing that you can do is just try and keep your stands very healthy. The thing, if you notice that you have mistletoe and mistletoes and trees and you might have a lot of firs in your stand is to actually increase the spacing. Because I know that I said, you know, uh, birds can also, um, uh, carry dwarf mistletoe around, but it seems that most of the time that infections really do come from seed dispersal and that trees that are, you know, a host trees that are close together, those seeds can actually travel quite a distance, up to 60 feet. And so they can infect, you know, canopies that are fairly close together, as well as again, if, if there's any region um, or small trees in the understory, you know, that you might want to think about, well, looking at the condition of the large tree, is it really healthy if you want to protect your small tree? And so you might want to increase your spacing between trees, but really evaluate sometimes the condition of your tree overall. So I showed you kind of those, you know, those pictures of fairly ratty trees. And I'm not saying that, you know, you just need to cut those down. They're just poor, you know, poor health. But that, 
you know, again, that treatments really should be kind of stand or, or forest wide, that if you, you know, just in Increase the, the spacing, reduce competition, and you know if you have trees that are sick, to really be able to monitor them and look and see what their kind of ongoing conditions are. And it's particularly during drought. Um, we're always a little just more cautious when we know that it may be a drought year, that you know, doing any kind of cutting or management during those times, especially if trees are stressed that it could actually just aggravate a lot of the, you know, the, uh, the conditions that are already out there. So I hope that's, you know, anything that you can do to really just keep your stance healthy and vigorous. Thank you. Our next question is from Becky Wayman. She asks, did the fir mortality during and post drought seem more delayed than pine mortality? And do you have thoughts on why? Is it simply due to higher elevations seeing delayed effects from drought? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it, it was one of those things that when the drought was happening, right, you know, around 2014 and 2015, because it's, it's really always kind of been like clockwork, at least um, for as long as I've been around that whenever we have drought by the second or third year, we do start seeing, you know, dramatic increases in fur, um, fur mortality. But this time it was pretty delayed and it didn't seem like it was happening in these higher elevations, but we do just think that, um, that, you know, those higher elevations just might've had that buffer because they might still have been you know, getting enough precipitation to just keep them from, you know, really feeling the effects of, of the drought. So, you know, and as the drought is continuing, yes, now we're starting to see that surge of, of mortality. So one good year of rain, right, wasn't enough to just wipe away, you know, five years worth of drought. Great, thank you. Um, you've alluded a couple of times to how trees that have more competition might be more susceptible to some of these pathogens. And I'm wondering if when you compare those areas where you've seen really high tree mortality due to some of these pests and pathogens, does that correlate with areas that are maybe more departed from the historic range of variability in terms of forest structure? or that haven't had as much fire come through. I'm, I'm just thinking about the interactions between tree density and, the, and these insects and pathogens that you've been talking about. You know, with firs, um, they can have, especially red firs, can have much higher stand density than, um, than a lot of the pines or, you know, really they can, they can carry a lot of, basal area in those areas if precipitation is available and it's there. So, you know, on more northern slopes or wetter areas, you know, if they're receiving enough precipitation, they can still have a lot of, you know, still have a lot of trees. However, you know, again, um, there have been studies that show that, you know, when we have mortality with white fur, that it's really proportional to the amount of fur that's out there. And so, you know, reducing the number of white fur out there will mean that you will have less mortality. So there is something, you know, there, um, just like in the pines too, I mean, you know, the more trees that you have there, especially if you're in drier areas or areas that are becoming more dry or having more trees, that, you know, that competition is just increasing for those limited resources. Um, and so trees then are having to work harder. And trees that are, you know, again, that's why I feel like I needed to talk about the firs in particular is because they do seem a lot more vulnerable and susceptible to their damage agents in comparison to pines. Hey, thank you. Another virtual round of applause for Beverly. Thank you so much for giving us a presentation today and to all of you who attended the final feral webinar of the season.
We do have other virtual events coming up through the California Fire Science Consortium, including a two hour webinar on May 4th, where we will have a panel of experts discussing the outcomes of the 2019 Capels Fire on the El Dorado National Forest. So you can check out the California Fire Science Consortium website for more details about that as they become available. So thanks again, Beverly, and thanks to everybody. Thank you, everyone.